Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose is at it again, trying to make voting harder. This time, targeting drop boxes. Welcome back to Democracy Docket. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. Frank LaRose issued new guidance last month limiting who can use ballot drop boxes in Ohio. Now, the old rule used to be that if you were returning a mail-in ballot on behalf of a family member or a voter with a disability, you could return their absentee ballot to the ballot drop box. Under this new guidance, you have to walk into the Board of Elections office, turn over the ballot, and then sign a statement saying that you are adhering to local and federal law. Mark, what is the reasoning behind this new guidance? Because it seems like it just adds an extra unnecessary step. Yeah. So look, this is part of the Republican war on drop boxes, which is part of a larger war of the Republican Party against voting by mail. So I think it is important that we not lose the forest from the trees and that we don't um, we don't allow the Overton window of normal and abnormal to shift too far here. So let's just take a step back um, for much of the period in which there was mail-in voting in this country, uh, states had been adopting secure metal containers to receive those ballots. They look like mailboxes, the, the big mailboxes you'd see outside of a post office. They are entirely secure and, and they are open by election officials. They functionally operate the same as a mailbox does, except with high, heightened security and we, they, it allows the ballots to be collected by the election officials directly, which means it is easier and, uh, and, uh, uh, and more timely uh, delivery of ballots. This became increasingly important in 2020 because you had more people voting by mail and also because, frankly, Paige, we have seen uh, both for reasons that are just sort of the trend, we have seen a decline in uh, the timeliness of postal service delivery, but also because Donald Trump put in front of in charge of the U.S. Postal Service, uh, Louis DeJoy, uh, and he took a number of steps that made the U.S. Postal Service slower when it came to delivering mail-in ballots. And he continues to be in charge of the postal service, and that continues today. So against that backdrop, we have, you and I have done video after video after video about different tactics that Republicans are using to make the delivery of mail-in ballots harder, right? We've seen this in states like Texas. We've seen this in states like Georgia. We've seen this all over the country. Wherever Republicans are in charge, they, they, they target ballot drop boxes. Well, this is just Ohio's latest effort at it, right? Ohio passed a law to limit the number of drop boxes that each county could have. Kind of a weird law. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what they did. And now Frank LaRose is just taking it one step further. He is now uh, uh, trying to uh, limit the ability of, of drop boxes in this new way. He was sued last year successfully by groups that said that his, some of, that, that the Ohio laws uh, violated uh, Section 208 of the Voting Rights Act um, uh, because they hurt disabled voters' ability to vote. But Frank LaRose is just committed to this overall effort of proving himself a good Republican by targeting ballot drop boxes. Right. Frank LaRose claims that these laws are necessary to prevent ballot harvesting, which is a pejorative term to refer to when groups or individuals organize to help people return their mail-in ballots. Now, this isn't the first anti-democratic act by Frank LaRose. He has been a major player in anti-democracy efforts in Ohio for years, whether it be about redistricting or ballot measures or calling an illegal special election or um, you know, purging voters. He's really done it all. And now he's focused on ballot drop boxes. This same law that limited assistance to voters with disabilities also restricted the number of drop boxes in Ohio to one per county in the state. Uh, Ohio has 88 counties. Some are quite large. Some are kind of big and rural and, you know, not everything's pretty close to each other. But every single county can only have one ballot drop box. Now, Frank LaRose asked lawmakers last month to ban drop boxes in Ohio altogether. Ohio's Republican governor, Mike DeWine, said that's not necessary. We don't need to do that. But why is Ohio's chief election officer so hellbent on trying to make it harder to vote? I mean, look, you're entirely right. I mean, he is. this is his agenda. It's a very weird agenda for a secretary of state who oversees elections. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that... You know, being the secretary of state, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, like you basically made a name uh, for yourself by providing really good services for your constituents, the voters of your state around voting. Right. Like so the way you became a popular secretary of state was you made voting easier. You made it more convenient. 
And then you would potentially run for higher office on a platform of whether I'm a Democrat or Republican, I modernized, I streamlined, I cut bureaucracy, whatever it is. Like I, I, I modernized our election equipment, right? It was all about, you know, showing that you could deliver tangible results around elections uh, with, in terms of like the, the speed, accuracy and ease of voting. Um, and now Republicans kind of run on this opposite platform. It's like, I have made voting harder. I have made it less convenient. I have made it less secure. And, and, and it's just this perverse sort of platform now that people like Frank LaRose think are a springboard to higher office. And, you know, he ran in the, in the Senate primary. He didn't do very well uh, in the, in this year's Senate race. He may be looking that, you know, J, J.D. Vance, God forbid, could uh, become uh, elevated to the vice president's office. There'll be a special election in the Senate. Maybe he wants to run for that. Maybe he wants to run for governor. Who knows? I mean, who knows what motivates him? Maybe he just wants to be a speaker on like the the right wing grifter tour that I always see, you know, where like go from town to town and hold like, you know, they sell like gold medallions and fake watches or whatever. Uh, but but, you know, I, I don't know what motivates him, but it is clear that he has carved this out uh, as as his lane. A little more than a month from now, Ohio has several close elections. You know, it has obviously you have the presidential election, but there's also very close uh, congressional elections. There is a U.S. Senate race uh, that, you know, could could be instrumental in deciding who controls the U.S. Senate come next year. And of course, there are state Supreme Court races when the state Supreme Court there has been very actively involved in all of this back and forth around litigation. And, you know, one of the things I want to point out to people is that if you want to stay up to date on what is happening in those cases in all of this litigation, if you want to know why Frank LaRose is doing this and who else around the country is doing what they're doing, you know, take a a couple of minutes here and sign up for Democracy Docket. Uh, they have free weekly and daily newsletters that give you a summary of what's happening to democracy in court. If you want more than that, you can become a paid member. The link uh, is in, to both becoming a subscriber and a paid member is in the show notes below. Frank LaRose is also playing into the myth of non-citizens voting. Earlier this summer, he announced that state officials would be going through voter rolls to find alleged non-citizens. He, you know, drummed up a lot of noise about this. And then at the end of it, it turned out of the over 7 million people registered to vote in the state of Ohio, they found over 500 people who may not be citizens, not confirmed non-citizens, just alleged to be non-citizens. Now, this came at the same time that the state purged over 150,000 voters from the state's voter rolls. Most of those voters were inactive registrations, meaning that they hadn't cast a ballot within two federal election cycles. A large number of those voters were likely people who were homeless or experiencing housing instability and had listed their voter registration address as a homeless shelter. They got purged as well. Yeah. And look, the, the, this issue that you mentioned about non-citizen voting and and what Frank LaRose has done is part of a larger epidemic. I mean, we have seen in state after state, they claim that the number of non-citizen voters are this big. Then immediately, and I mean like pretty much immediately, it becomes clear it's at most this big. But Paige, the rest of the story is in the states that then dig in, the actual number turns out to be this big. So I suspect that when all is said and done, as we have seen in other states and as the Department of Justice in the lawsuit that they're bringing against Alabama is now uncovering, is that when you actually dig into even that small number, you find out these are people who are naturalized. You know, they were they were non-citizen. Now they become naturalized or they have a similar name to someone. But but when you actually bear down the numbers, it turns out that there are virtually no or no non-citizens voting uh, that are, uh, and it is only U.S. citizens who are being caught up in all of this drama and having their names dragged through and their voter registration dragged through this process for the political gain of Republican uh, uh, politicians uh, like, uh, like Frank LaRose. Democracy Docket's Sophie Feldman recently did a video digging in into non-citizens voting and the DOJ's lawsuit against Alabama for conducting a voter purge that actually ended up catching a lot of naturalized citizens in the mix. So you can click the link up above to watch it. But Mark, one of the astounding facts I learned from that video was that in 2019, then Texas's Secretary of State announced that they had identified 95,000 non-citizens on the voter rolls and told counties to begin purging those voters. 
a couple of lawsuits later, it then turned out that tens of thousands of those voters were naturalized citizens. They were eligible to vote. They, it ended up unfairly targeting Latino voters across the state, and it ultimately led to the resignation of Texas Secretary of State. Well, I mean, the biggest surprise about that is that there was a re Republican elected official in the state of Texas who had any shame that they actually resigned. I mean, you know, I look at Ken Paxton and I look at Greg Abbott and I'm thinking, boy, the most honorable Republican I may have heard of in the state is I, whoever this secretary of state was who 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 at least was willing to resign. I mean, well, look at what Ken, look at what Ken Paxton is doing. Not to give too much credit to this guy, David Whiteley, he was acting secretary of state. He would have been kicked out of office had he not resigned by that date. So, you know, not to have the blemish on his record that he was booted out of office, he chose to resign. Yeah, well, you know, I would point After out that he didn't receive confirmation from the Texas Senate to continue in the role because of this voter purge. Yeah, well, today he would probably get an award for an illegal voter purge by Republicans, and it just shows you how bad the Republican Party has gotten on this issue of voting. And to my point earlier, it used to be that secretaries of state were held to be accountable if they did things like that and were celebrated if they increased uh, voter registration and the ability of people to vote. And now the incentives of the Republican in the Republican Party are entirely the reverse. And that is why you need to make sure you are subscribed to Democracy Docket's free daily and weekly newsletters. Thanks for watching this edition of Democracy Docket. We'll see you next time.